Greetings from New York. My name is Dimitar Marinov. I play Oleg in Green Book. I hope you enjoy the film. Now you're listening to Tomorrow Comes Movies. Hey everyone, this is Patrick and... Marissa. We're here with a very special guest. If you're a big fan of Green Book, he played Oleg in the Don Shirley's trio. Ladies and gentlemen, Dimitar Marinov. How are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. So our first question is, what inspired you to get into acting? Oh, well, according to my mother, since I was born, I was acting. (laughs) But I was a classical violinist since age of four. By age of 11, I became first chair in the symphony orchestra, youth orchestra. I grew up in the communist country of Bulgaria. And then by age of 15, my birth mother, because I was adopted, and my birth mother was a teacher on those summer camps for little children. And I visit her for three days towards the end of her camp and uh, there was a gentleman who's supposed to play the king of the forest for the little kids but he maybe you guys know back in the communist days people get drunk all the time so he got quite drunk and couldn't make it so my mom asked me if i can entertain the kids so it was kind of funny i loved it so i put on this ropes and beard and things and i entertained the kids for about an hour and there was a lady, which is one of the icons of the Bulgarian film industry, and uh, she was visiting because her daughter was in the camp. And she came to me directly after I get off and said, you are born to be an actor. I said, oh, well, please don't tell my mom that. Um, <laughs> I'm, an, I'm a violinist. And she said, well, it's time to switch professions. And she handed me her personal phone number, which for me was a shock. I mean, she was an icon, mm-hmm. literally. and. Um, a few months later, I get her a call and I went to her apartment without my mother knowing. And uh, she kind of gave me a few things to work on and we start going back and forth. And I was paying, hiding money and paying for my little lessons once a week for about four months. And then she said, you know what? I think you should go pro and apply for the theater academy. And my entire family knew that I'm applying for the conservatory with a violin. Actually, I didn't. I applied for the theater academy and I was accepted. And for the first three years, my parents didn't know that I'm studying as an actor in the master's program. They thought I was studying as a violinist. So <laughs> it started and uh, I graduated with master's degree with honors from the Bulgarian National Academy of Film and Television. And then I had about six months at clown school in Moscow, which I loved it. And <laughs> That's how it all started, way back. So do you still remember a lot of the, the clown techniques from the school? Actually, yes. And, <laughs> uh, of course, my parents were absolutely, they were shocked. And clowning in Europe, as you know, it's all traditional. and That means you're at the bottom of the barrel. And But I loved it as a physicality. It, in Europe, clowning is something else than here. It's not just blowing balloons and getting too much makeup. <laughs> More of a Charlie Chaplin kind of old school of the tramp of the, you know. And kids love clowns in Europe, actually. And just last year, I was auditioning for Baskets. Hmm. And Zach Galifniakis personally wanted to talk to me after he saw my tape and said, you know what, we don't just need someone to play a clown. We need someone to actually write a whole scene a clowning routine. So we got together in rehearsal and I start helping and all of a sudden we got into a big argument with him and Jonathan, the creator. And I said, guys, you think like actors. You cannot think like actors when you do clowning. Clowns don't think of a story. They think of an obstacle. One obstacle. And they they play in many different ways to solve the obstacle. That's what clowns do. Kind of like Mr. Bean. (laughs) it's all physicality it's like you have one little issue and you try to solve it the problem is and what comes funny is the way you solve that problem so if you look at the second season of baskets which is the last episode called circus there's a huge about four or five minute scene between me and him playing as clowns that entire scene was my creation and of course, I love clowning. I, I love the clowning as art, not just as my mom would say, you keep clowning around, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's very fascinating. My wife, too, actually. 
<laughs> just like it. <laughs> now, how did you land the role in uh, Green Book? Oh, boy, that was a saga. All <laughs> right, so here is the something very funny. Not funny, actually. When my manager sent me the audition, and there was a little explanation that it's actually based on a true story, and the character that I am auditioning for is a true character from the Don Shirley trio. Chamber trio, and the name immediately rang a bell in my head. I said, oh my gosh, I know this name. Where do I know this name from? So instead of internet, I'm old school. I went to the library, I started <laughs> digging into old newspapers and all those roll-on things <laughs> back in the 40s and the 50s, and all of a sudden I saw the picture. There's only one picture existing that day, actually, this person, Yuri Tacht. And I said, oh my gosh, I studied this guy at music school. <laughs> Back in the days, when I was in music school, we had one of the lectures for history of music was about betrayal people. Mm. Means bad guys. Guys who are extraordinary musicians trained by the communist school of music and then they defected to America to play jazz and they betrayed the country. They're basically enemies of the state. Oh, wow. And he was one of them. <laughs> he graduated the, yes, the Leningrad Conservatory back in the 40s. Not only he was an extraordinary cello player, and then that's where he met with Don Shirley, when Don Shirley graduated the Leningrad Conservatory as well. It was kind of weird, uh, uh, the first ever at this conservatory, and how come during the worst times of communism, and he performed for Khrushchev and all that stuff, so anyway, so those two escaped to the United States to play jazz. He escaped, literally, to play jazz, and they formed the trio. Well, knowing all that and ga gathering all the fact facts now from here, I prepare for the audition, and basically, here is the funny story. Not really, but... <laughs> Yuri Tacht, in 1962, when the story is taking place, is 52 years old. When I auditioned for this part, I was 52 years old. Yuri Tacht... Is father Jew, mother Christian. My father is a Jew, my mother is a Christian. Oh, wow. wow. He graduated the communist school of music, I did too. He escaped the United States to play jazz, I escaped the United States with a music show to play jazz. Oh, so, funny. and then the picture, if you look at the picture of Yuri Tak and my face, we are literally twin brothers, <laughs> skinny with big nose, and the only difference is he wears glasses. So, my preparation for the audition was mainly try to be myself and remember the times of the communists, how the classical musicians were so conservative, so stuck up, so proud. So you cannot crack a smile ever out of a guy. They're very boring people. So <laughs> I try to maintain this mentality of solid, serious, and so and so. So I went to the audition, I did my actor's choice, then the casting asked me to flip it and do a very youthful, uh, emotional, more young, more, you know, so I did. And then, a week later, I was cast out. Basically, they said, great job, but unfortunately, too mature for the role. Oh, wow. Sorry. And I was, as an actor, those things don't bother me, it's a business. They like me or they don't like me, but for this particular role, I said, this is, this cannot be. Either they're getting something wrong or there's going to be some of those cheesy movies that nothing's going to be true. <laughs> so then, a month later, my manager calls me and says, Demeter, actually, they want to see you again for that green book thing. I said, what are you talking about? He said, remember the Russian cello player? I said, oh, yeah. And he, I said, what do you mean? He said, well, obviously, they went back to the drawing table, and they're reconsidering, and they want to see you. But this time, they want to see you playing the cello. I said, wait, I don't play a cello. <laughs> I play violin. He said, oh, can you play a cello? I said, well, does it count how many cello players I play with? <laughs> <laughs> that was good. <laughs> and he said, Demeter, please be serious. <laughs> How much time I have? And he said, well, five days. And that's a Saturday. I said, great. All right. So what do they need? He said, well, they want you to see, they want to see if you have a basic skill of playing cello. 
classical. So, all right. So that very day on Saturday, I Google. I found a teacher from San Diego Symphony. On the Sunday was my first lesson. I rented the cello, and then in the next four days, my wife literally was ready to divorce me <laughs> um, because I was doing six to seven hours a day. I mean, being a classical musician, I know what it takes. And my cello teacher, she was say, Demir, you're going to literally injure your hands. You need to stop. You need to relax. I said, no, I'm not. I need to do this. So then one of the composers of the film sent me two of the songs that will be from the movie. One is the theme song, Waterboy. It starts with this beautiful cello solo about 18 bars. And said, uh, try that, blah, blah, blah. And there was the impression, you know, that I can do it. So then I went to my cello teacher the day before and I said, this is the song I want to play tomorrow. I said, Demeter, you're going too far. There's no way. <laughs> I said, no. You sit down, you play it. I'm going to take my phone. I'm going to make a video. Please, I want to watch your hands. Want to see it? And then we'll see. So the next day I went to the audition. I got about 15 minutes to talk about myself in front of Peter Farrelly, Nick Bellalonga. Everybody was there. Uh, and then I talk about 10 minutes about the character. And then Peter made a note and said, Demeter, uh, we feel very embarrassed right here, all the writers. You know more about the character than we do. <laughs> and the script is already done. <laughs> I'm sorry. So anyways, but they said, okay, let's see the cello. I said, okay. So Tom, the music arrange a uh, designer of the show says, Demeter, no pressure. We just want to see if you look professional holding that cello and trying to play a few notes. I said, no, I'm playing the lead song of the movie. They start laughing. All right, give it a shot. So I did actually play it. And then Tom looked at Peter and said, I didn't know he can play cello, but he does play cello. And this is impressive. And then Peter said, would you a violinist? I said, yep. <laughs> but I had to learn this. So, <laughs> and that's what then I went to, into my acting. So now as an actor, being around for a while, I'm taking under consideration the note that I received, the feedback from casting in my first casting. So I'm doing the, char the character as I was suggested, right? <laughs> and I'm doing it very youthful, very blah, blah, blah. And then Peter gets to my face, I mean, literally inches from my face and very quietly whispers in my ear, said, Demeter, I have a problem. You talked for 10 minutes about this character and we were shocked how well you know this character. Why you choose to do it this way? And I said, well, that was a feedback from the first casting <laughs> and I'm sorry, but um, I'm trying to follow. I thought that's what you guys looking for. He said, Demeter, did you do it the same way at the first audition? I said, no, I had my different choice. Well, let me see your choice. So I did my choice. And then he got so close to my face and literally grabbed my face with two hands. <laughs> said, Demeter, remember one thing from me. You never, ever take any feedback from anybody until you book the part. <laughs> and after... The only one who can give you feedback is the director. And still, there is room for argument. This is what I wanted. I'm done. And I didn't even do my second scene. <laughs> and that was it. And then later, I was told that there were two other contenders for the part, which are literally mega stars. And they had a viewing. And they asked Vigo and Mahershala, what they think, who they think, who they like to be their, you know, support. And all of them, and especially Vigo, said, well, I vote for this guy. <laughs> it's me. And, but Peter, you have a problem. And Peter said, what do you mean? He said, well, you have to make a choice. Either you go with Mr. Nobody, but genuine, true, real, there was no difference between him talking about himself and his acting. He's so true. There is no, no fake stuff. Or you go with a big star and count on popularity. He said, whatever you want to do. <laughs> and of course, Peter made the, the call and took another three weeks. So basically the whole process were about two months. <laughs> wow.
This is a... Uh, yeah, it was tough. <laughs> but then we went to New Orleans. They had cello for me. They got a teacher for me. And I put a lot of work onto it. But we got the songs down. It's fascinating, and I'm glad that they chose you because I think you were phenomenal in the film, especially, you know, you got Marshall Ali, you got Vito, Vito Mortison, and you and you hold your own. And, and I especially, one of my favorite scenes with you is the whole uh, Vigo's character, Tony, taking that rock, which Chris and I had a blast watching you <laughs> tell Marshall. Mer- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you took that rock, dude. <laughs> well, um, there's a little secret behind the scenes. When this is the very first day of shooting I had. And when we arrive on set in this beautiful little gas station in the middle of nowhere with the Cadillacs and Peter is talking to Vigo. Peter is talking to Mahershala and he's never saying anything to me. <laughs> the only thing he said was you go there, you talk to Vigo, uh, to Mahershala, you tell him you saw the rock and that's it. So I did what I did and we did it one time, two times, three times and Peters keep talking to other guys, and he never talks to me. And I felt like, oh my gosh, what, what, what am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? And it was very, very first experience working with such a mega stars and the, the director and the whole production. And then I, we took a little break, and I approached Peter and said, I'm sorry, I didn't want to intrude in any way, but you've been talking to those guys, and you never said a word to me. And he looks at me with his warm, big smile. I mean, Peter is amazing and funny. And he goes, Demeter, I hired you, didn't I? <laughs> I said, yes. Well, do your thing. <laughs> and that was, that was the only note, director's note, I ever had throughout the entire shooting. Wow. The only thing, I mean, which the very first day when I arrived, Peter gave me this big hug and he said, so be yourself, do your thing, but remember, your job is don't take your eyes off Vigo at all times. This is your job. I said, all right, and then later, that note, and that was it. I never, ever had any notes. Actually, I had one, it's not a note, but Peter pulled me aside. If you remember the moment where I'm scolding Vigo, <laughs> uh, Dr. Shirley asked for this. Yes. And I had the cigarette, and I dropped the cigarette. <laughs> that was that moment when Vigo was very frustrated. He cannot react to my little monologue there, and he cannot get upset. He cannot, and we were struggling with this because the way it was written, it didn't work. And then Peter, I mean, Vigo literally walked off set. He said, I need a break. I need to rethink this. And then Vigo pulled me aside and said, Demeter, come on, you're a physical actor. You should come up with something. I'm counting on you. Just surprise me. Surprise him. Mm. Challenge him somehow. And that's where I become with that bit with the cigarette. And Vigo actually, before we start shooting, he came in and said, I need your help. Please do something to piss me off. <laughs> I said, well, I have an idea. <laughs> so let's see how it works out. And believe it or not, this scene is one take only. Ooh, wow. That was it. And actually, when I dropped the cigarette, landed on his shoe. <laughs> <laughs> and then they have the shot of that, but then Peter decided not to put it in because nobody would believe that actually happened for real. <laughs> he said, it's going to look cheesy, but we know we have it. I said, great. So, I mean, it was amazing. It was no, I, I have to say that uh, after we walked out of the movie theater, I, I think that this might be my favorite film of the year. I, I think it's it's just incredible. I mean, from all the performances, including yourself, and I love your line in the film about it takes courage to change people's hearts. That's what sold me on the trailer was when I had seen that and I heard you say that in the trailer. I said, Chris, we got to watch this movie. And she's like, Vigo Mortensen, Mersha Holly, I'm already in. <laughs> I'm already in, but I was like, but that line, that line to me defines the film, yeah. and, and, and it truly is is what makes that film uh, so special. Is, is the message of this film? Well, um, I can share for this particular line a little insert if you like me to. Oh yeah, sure. That was uh, we were in. I mean, literally, it was 27 degrees outside. Ooh. It was a freezing day, yeah. and we have 300 extras in this beautiful room there, and all the setup and everything. And as you know, this is like the flip of the entire film. This is where Tony Lip, his mind needs to go 
battle for the cause. So, as the whole film, I, I think there's one thing that was kind of missing for me, in a way, is to reveal the reason, although it's in my monologue at that scene, why Dr. Shirley is doing this whole thing. He's basically getting even for what they did in Alabama, in Birmingham, six years ago to Napkin Cole, which is mm -hmm. a true story. He got beat up pretty badly. And Mahers I mean, Dr. Shirley is going on that trip with that only reason and mission to teach them a lesson. And that's why I was so anal throughout the entire film, making sure that Tony Lip won't do anything stupid to jeopardize that final mission. And that was the whole idea of my character, and that's my whole focus of the character. So in the end, when we're at the restaurant, the line, after my little monologue about not getting called, the line was very talkative. It was kind of long line written. And it didn't work, and it didn't work, and it didn't work. And Vigo, again, got really frustrated and told Peter, I cannot feel this. I cannot, this, the way it is right now, cannot change my mind. It cannot put me on the edge. So I become a friend in my heart, in my mind, and go for the cause and make the call. Let's get out of here. And they try all different ways, and Vigo keep apologizing. Demeter, it's not your fault, it's me. I just don't feel it. I don't get it. So then, a little secret for all of you guys, uh, <laughs> Vigo and I were the only two who smoke okay. in the entire cast. <laughs> 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 and him being in Denmark, from Denmark, and I being from Bulgaria, Europe, Europeans, you know, we always for the smoke and for the wine and all that stuff. So we became very close in personal level as well. Although my manager and agent told me, Demeter, please stay away from cigarettes. People <laughs> hate cigarettes. Be careful, hide. And I call him day three and I said, actually, thank God the cigarettes are friend with Vigo. <laughs> so anyways, and all of a sudden Vigo got so frustrated. And we have all those extras. I mean, there was a lot of pressure. And he said, all of a sudden, he stood up and said, I need a, I need a break. He grabbed me, literally, and said, Demir, let's go smoke. So we walked out in this balcony with those huge jackets, freezing <laughs> cold. And we start talking. And Vigo said, please, I need your help. Like you did it with the cigarette previous times. Please, we need to come up. You need to do something to at least make me go. Oh, you know, and I said, Vigo, can I share with you? I know where the problem is, in my opinion. I think the line is not right. I mean, it's just not right. And he said, what do you mean? I said, it's too talkative. If you say this to me, there's no way for me to flip. Literally, there's no way. And he said, well, let's change it. I said, well, I have an idea, but I don't know if the big boy's going to agree with it. He said, oh. Oh, don't worry about it. I said, yeah, easy for you to say. You're a bigger Martin than I am. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they will never say anything to you. And he said, no, I'll back you up. What is the line? I said, well, if I tell you the line now, ain't going to be a challenge, will it? And he goes, all right, let's go shoot. I said, <laughs> I said all right, but he said, don't worry about it. Let's go. So he flicked his cigarette. We walked in, and there's Peter Fairley. With a big smile, said, guys, you're ready to try it? And people say, no, we're not trying anything. Please, we should. We have an idea. He said, don't you want to try it? I said, and he, Vigo, is the one talking. He said, no, 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 no. Let, let, let's give it a shot. We, we, we work something out. Let's see if it looks good or not. And then you make the decision. So we sat down. We did the whole thing. And as you see it in the movie, he's eating. And after my monologue, I had this line, you asked me once, why Dr. Shirley does this? I'll tell you. And then I lean forward, which was this little physical thing that I come up with on top of the line. And I lean forward and that what really took Vigo by surprise. And he stopped chewing and looked at me and then I shut the line that you now know. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Vigo no shit, you know, his reaction. And then this huge scream of Peter Farrelly, cut! <laughs> and he's running through the whole 
restaurant with teary eyes with Brian Curry <laughs> next to him and Nick Vallelonga and it's like Vigo that was brilliant <laughs> and Vigo said nope that guy right there he did it all and we got all those hugs and they're teary eyed and then of course Brian Curry with his shocking sense of humor this man is amazing he goes but you changed the line <laughs> uh, Vigo told me <laughs> and that was it that was one take wow. one take and then later we talked with Vigo and Vigo said man you have one thing that I admire is your instinct and you're not trying to act you're not trying to say two lines or long lines or get a facial recognition and facial time you are straight down to the point and that's what it's very rare to see and that was the biggest compliment I ever got from Vigo. Of course, the last scene, which is the first scene we meet with the cigarette bit, remember when he found <laughs> a cigarette for me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was not on the script at all and that was the very last day of filming. That was the day we wrapped the whole production and we had those lines there that made no sense and then finally Peter said you know we need something to establish those two characters for the first time they meet we need to see him being the guy who threatens the mission and then you Demeter you have to be the guy who says uh oh I have a problem with this guy I'm gonna keep eye on this guy and then we went back and forth the same story and then we of course had another cigarette break with Vigo and Vigo <laughs> said come on I said well being from communist country we had no money and cigarettes were literally gold. So every Bulgarian I remember back in the days, even if they have cigarettes, they will bump cigarettes to save. <laughs> so <laughs> in this case, let's follow that. You pull out your cigarette, you're about to light up, you see me, and you're, oh, I'm going to bump a cigarette. That establishes you as a cook. Then you come to me, and then we play from there. But you don't have to do anything. You just get the cigarette, and go for the light. Let me play the rest, and it will look good. And then, of course, Vigo tells Peter, we have great idea, it's very funny. And <laughs> Peter screams, no funny, I don't want funny. <laughs> this is not funny. And Vigo said, no, 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 I meant you will like it. So we did it, and again, that one was, again, oh, yeah. just one take. Mm -hmm. So we had a great collaboration. That was amazing. Yeah, I definitely like listen to these stories because yeah it, i like that it's a very collaborative process from peter farley to vigo to Mershala. everyone wants to make this movie fantastic which it is one of the best if not personally my favorite film of the year i think it's incredible and and a thank you for your incredible performance in the film you did a great job oh, my pleasure of course i for me it was a thrill and especially the freedom that peter gives to everybody and the way it's so easy to work with him it, you don't even feel like you're working. It's like friendship. And you're next to Oscar winner. You're next to Viggo Mortensen. And you don't feel a thing. Always hugs. Are you okay? Do you feel it? Do you want to change it? This constant friendly, like, I feel like I'm in the community there. I mean, so simple, so easy. There's no dictation, like, most of the directors, this is my vision, this is what you do, this is what I want you to do. No, no, no. This is what we all need to accomplish. Let's see how we're going to accomplish it. And it was extraordinary way of nobody in any way, pressure or drama moments or I'm the high rank, you're low rank, you're this, you're that. There was no even feel of that. And with Mahershala, when we work on the Russian scene, he had a prior coaching with Russian and he was, he was very nervous because he said, I, Demeter, I, please help me. I don't remember a thing. And it's so hard for me. And when I look at what they had translated for him, I said, Mahershala, of course, even I wouldn't learn this. This is just <laughs> in my brain. <laughs> we were driving with 60 miles an hour and have a conversation of 30 seconds. And here is written like, you're going to do, on a Karenina or something. <laughs> no. We cut it all down. We make the basic lines just to get the idea. And literally within 20 minutes, Mahershala spoke Russian. Oh. And even today, he keeps saying, 
hey, I can learn Russian. Uh, <laughs> if Demeter is around. <laughs> so, we had a great, great, great relationship with him, too. Well, congratulations. The Golden Globe nominations, uh, Green Book nabbed five of them. It's, it's an incredible feat. I'm sure you're just all jacked up for it. And you probably got a suit ready to go. Well, that's, uh, that's, uh, for me, honestly, it's not, of course, it's my Cinderella moment. Dream come true. But honestly, I will be the very first Bulgarian actor who is in a major role in such a film with so many nominations and Hopefully, will be the very first Bulgarian actor who's going to step on the red carpet at the Oscars. And it's huge for my country as well. I mean, I am an American. I've been here for over 28 years. And I consider myself American. I am married to American. That was my life. But my heritage, my background is Bulgarian. And I do keep connections in Bulgaria and friends and relatives and colleagues. But it will be a proud moment that one of us made it and will help others to understand and get the courage to go for their dreams and knowing that Hollywood is not about connections or it's so difficult and you can never make it because you're a foreigner or you have an accent or you don't know anybody, you're not connected. No, everyone has a chance and I'm a pure example of this. I live in Carlsbad, which is down San Diego County. <laughs> I travel all the time. I have a wonderful family, 12-year-old and 5-year-old. I'm an old daddy, but <laughs> family is my first priority. And my work as an actor is what I dream of and what I'm focused on. But still, I know and I've been through the whole process. I only started nine years ago in Hollywood. I oh, did a lot of theater prior, but... Always, if you stay focused, if you really do not betray yourself and you have clear idea what it's all about and have, of course, the talent and don't betray yourself and be yourself, of course. And I, I proved it already many times with TV shows and other films I was involved in, and especially this is my biggest, of course, that's my breakthrough. And this will be the pride for me to show all my country fam and, and <laughs> not only here in the United States, the young actors and upcoming actors, come on, drop that excuse and com complain, oh, Hollywood is a mafia, Hollywood is connection. No, it's not. We all have plays there. Just need to find it and stop complaining. Just go do your job. <laughs> I love that. I, love I see it. <laughs> no, it's, it's very inspirational. Uh, I would like to be an actor. I'm, I'm, I'm getting close to 30. I don't usually say my age very much, but uh, yeah, that's very inspiring because I, you know, a lot of people have said sometimes it's you got to do it when you're young. But I mean, you're in Green Book, so I'm like, I can do it. I don't know if I'll be able to say a one line as good as you, but I, if if we ever do a movie together, please, <laughs> please come help don't me out. Don't say that. <laughs> don't say that. See, that's the thing. It, it's this. It, presumption we all have because of we're either scared or we don't know or ego or vanity or whatever it's involved. No, it's not true. I started at 45 in Hollywood. And if you look at my resume, especially commercials, they used to call me the king of commercials. <laughs> I always go and I do what I feel I would do myself. Even sometimes People kind of laugh and say, Demir, you're far off. And I said, I know, but that's me. <laughs> if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, fine. Find somebody else. And this is, there's no rejection. And people think it's reject. No, it's not. We actors, we have three things we have to do. Only three things. Audition, show up on time, and learn your lines. That's it. We have nothing else to do. It's a, such a, a, if you have the talent and the belief and the trust in yourself, that's all you need to do. And every single audition, the way I see the audition, it's a performance. Hmm. That's what we actors want to do. We want to have audience all the time. <laughs> and for me, the audition is audience. Here I am. How you doing, guys? Let me perform 30 seconds for you. <laughs> you know? And in the end is the attitude, which sometimes I talk to young upcoming actors and I said, you need to understand the attitude is the key. You don't have to try to please them. You don't have to be nice and sweet. Hi, how you doing? <laughs> no. And you don't have to be cocky. But you have to be solid. 
be yourself, and there's one key for your attitude. When you go to an audition, you have to know one thing and one thing only. They have a problem, you are the solution. Wow. That's how I see it. A director and writer and producer get together, they want to do their project, and they have a problem. They don't have the actor for the, for the role. And you are the solution. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I see it. You know, and if, if you have that in your heart and you trust yourself, please, of course, you might not hit this, you might not hit that, you might not do this, you might not do that, but you know what? It will come your time. Patience, focus, and devotion, period. Everything else is not important. I mean, I, in, in my case, in the way I see it, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, thank you. But thank it works for me. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for the advice. And of course, we'd like to ask if you have social media or some website, please plug it in so that people can definitely uh, check check up on you and your next project. Well, I am not. I'm kind of, again, old school for me. <laughs> I have an Instagram, which is Demeter. Uh, so Demeter, what is it? Under that, whatever. D. Marinoff, which is my Facebook. And then mainly my PR, they, they plug in things in there. I don't really know how to do it much. <laughs> <laughs> but I have the IMDB uh, profile, and actually in uh, the first week of January, I'm flying to New York. It's a movie I did two years ago. Extraordinary film with the entire team of Birdman. Um, Molly Cohen, who oh. was the producer of Birdman that got the Oscar. Oh, yeah. She put it together, a new film, which is again based on a true story. And we filmed this two years ago in New York. It's called Russian American on IMDb. And I'm one of the leads. That was my huge movie break. Um, and they doing the official screening, uh, in January 8th in New York. And hopefully next year, you're going to see that one too, which I play a doctor surgeon who is a real character true to the Brighton Beach Russian society of doctors. And it's about this huge medical fraud that happened back in the 80s. And um, really interesting film. And it's on IMDb. But I'm not much into social media. But I have the Instagram, I have the Facebook, and I have the IMDb. That's all it is. Well, I, I can guarantee you that we're going to be checking out your next film, Russian American. Is that what it's called? Yeah, it's yeah. called Russian American. I mean, if you go on my IMDb profile, you will see it. It's already there. Uh, used to be called work title was Brighton Beach. It was like mm. really, really amazing. You will see the people in it. A really interesting, young and great actors in the film. I mean, pretty challenging. Costa Ronin is one of them who is in the Americans, the young KGB guy who is now in Homeland as well. Uh, he's my partner there in the movie. So really, really good cast, really interesting cast and amazing story. And it's filmed by the greatest Oleg Muto, oh, wow. the gentleman from Moldova who created, and that was his whole vision of the new cinematography movement of the camera, which you saw in Birdman. Oh, yeah. That style. And we had the pleasure, he was our cinematographer in the movie himself. And it was amazing to work with this man. He's crazy. <laughs> so hopefully that will be the next one big one that will come out and I'm just just booked actually yesterday at 4.30 in the afternoon book a national commercial with Stella Paul oh wow congratulations <laughs> I had a commercial in a year and now booking this one it was really fun it's kind of again up in my alley so comedy and kind of a real style comedy, so I liked it. <laughs> That's a good one, my Christmas present. <laughs> well, we want to take the time to thank you, Demeter, for coming on, and thank you for your performance in Green Book, and we'd love to have you come back on when Russian American releases. We'll definitely be reviewing it, and, and we'd love to talk to you more. You, you give quite a lot of insight, and it makes Green Book even more exciting. If you haven't seen it, if you're listening to this, you need to go see Green Book, especially Demeter's performance, which is incredible. Thank you so much, guys. It was really an honor. Really appreciate it.